So, uh, students, uh, colleagues and friends, uh, welcome to this uh, new course uh, called uh, the Quantum Hall Effects. And the reason that uh, it is called Quantum Hall Effects, usually you would see that uh, it is written as Quantum Hall Effect. But here uh, along with uh, original Quantum Hall Effect, I would also like to talk about anomalous Quantum Hall Effect and Spin Hall Effect. And that is why this uh, plural is used along with uh, the quantum hall effect. So, that is effects, that is that's what it means. Uh, in this course, uh, there will be a sort of um, a number of topics that are going to be taught. I will introduce the topics um, uh, in brief. Uh, but before that, uh, let me tell you the motivation for this course. Quantum hall effect was uh, discovered in 1980. Uh, which is about 100 years later than the classical Hall effect was discovered. And um, I will talk about the, uh, you know, the discovery in details, but this was the first example of uh, what is called as a, the topological insulator that was uh, first, uh, you know, talked about. So, the quantum Hall systems are the first examples of uh, topological insulators and that is why uh, the effect and its associated phenomena are uh, important. And then uh, it sort of uh, migrated from its original notion of applying a magnetic field in a 2D electron gas. It went on to various areas such as uh, you do not have to uh, apply a magnetic field and it is just important to break the time reversal symmetry of the system. And that is what uh, quantum Hall effect uh, means. I mean uh, the anomalous quantum Hall effect would mean that and then uh, when the time reversal symmetry is restored, uh, that is uh, will give rise to another kind of quantum Hall system which is called as a spin Hall effect and uh, constitutes another topological insulator that is uh, found in nature. I will talk about the experiments as well. So, just to give you a brief uh, uh, sort of overview of uh, the course, the content of the course. We are going to talk about uh, transport in mesoscopic systems uh, to uh, begin with. Uh, then we will give a historical introduction to the uh, Hall effect. We will talk about first about classical Hall effect which was discovered in 1879 by uh, Edwin Hall. Then we will talk about uh, quantum Hall effect, its discovery in uh, 2D electron gases uh, and uh, the Hall resistivity and the conductivity and uh, uh, the experimental sort of realization of 2D electron gas. We will talk about uh, the metrology that how quantum Hall effect actually establishes uh, from an experiment in the lab establishes the scale of resistance, uh, the fundamental scale of resistance which is given by h over e square and um, then we will talk about um, the integer uh, quantum Hall effect. In fact, most of the um, discussion we are going to talk about uh, integer quantum Hall effect excepting uh, for one uh, module or one unit we are going to talk about fractional quantum Hall effect. Then uh, we will talk about um, you know how to approach this problem, what are the Landau levels, how actually you know uh, electrons in presence of a magnetic field, uh, planar electrons that is electrons uh, confined in 2D planes uh, that gives rise to the Landau levels and these Landau levels in principle have infinite degeneracy. And, um, we will also talk about the quantum of flux associated with it uh, and uh, that is the how the, um, the degeneracy is uh, represented in terms of the quantum of flux. Uh, we will talk about the Shubnikov dehas effects oscillations and so on and um, uh, will among this um, understanding of the quantum Hall effect can also be achieved uh, by Laughlin's argument of a Corbino ring. Uh, which he actually um, thought of uh, as a quantum Hall pump, so a disk geometry. It is a thought experiment uh, and it explains the uh, presence of um, you know the, the quantum of uh, flux and, and the, uh, the integer number of uh, electrons being transferred from one, uh, the edge of the disk, the inner edge of the disk to the outer edge and that is called as a Corbino ring. We will talk about that. We will talk about uh, the role of disorder and uh, the presence of eight states which are 
uh, the signature hallmark signatures of uh, topological insulators. We will talk about uh, Hall conductivity, how to calculate Hall conductivity um, and uh, from a linear response theory and we will talk about the derivation of the Kubo formula uh, and uh, we will see that how uh, the whole idea actually uh, falls in place uh, by the argument of uh, four people, uh, Thaulis, Komoto, uh, Dennis and, um, and Nightangle. Uh, and uh, this is uh, like um, uh, relating the Hall conductivity to the churn number and uh, then we will talk about the topological consideration, the Gauss bonnet theorem, uh, the Berry connection, the Berry curvature and uh, also we will go over from a 2D electron gas uh, and uh, we will start talking about in a lattice system or uh, which in uh, as a sort of recent example we will take graphene to be that lattice. Uh, where we get uh, linear dispersion near the, the low energy dispersion is linear near the Fermi level and we will show that uh, the quantization of the plateaus and uh, how graphene nano ribbons are um, will give rise to these uh, presence of the chiral edge states. What we mean by chiral edge states is that at one edge in a nano ribbon geometry in one edge the electron traverses a, along one direction say towards the right and in the other edge it traverses towards the left and that establishes the bulk boundary correspondence. Uh, we will also talk about fractional quantum Hall effect and um, how uh, the, the fractional quantization of the Hall plateaus arise because of uh, you know the electronic uh, interactions, the Coulomb interactions. Uh, we will talk about Laughlin wave function uh, and we will talk about the solution of the Schrodinger equation now in symmetric gauge um, because uh, we have circular uh, Landau levels here. Uh, then we will talk about fractional statistics a uh, bit on uh, fractional charge, anions and braiding statistics and so on. And uh, we will talk about uh, spin Hall effect and uh, spin orbit coupling. In particular, we will talk about Rajpa spin orbit coupling, we will talk about this uh, applications to spintronics, uh, we will talk about experiments in real materials and uh, these uh, mercury telluride and cadmium telluride quantum wells and how a band inversion occurs there uh, which gives rise to a, a quantum spin hall um, uh, state which is uh, another state uh, in addition to the quantum hall state that we have. Uh, uh, will will learn throughout the course. So, uh, let me start with uh, the first thing that uh, we had uh, decided to do that is uh, let us talk about uh, generally about conductance phenomena in mesoscopic systems. So, let me uh, start with uh, <coughs> the mesoscopic systems and in principle uh, talk about uh, a few length scales of the problem. Uh, that are important in the present discussion. Okay. Uh, so, what is meant by mesoscopic system? Uh, so, these are uh, you know anything uh, between the macroscopic and the microscopic or the nanoscopic uh, systems and um, we are mainly going to be concerned uh, with these the low dimensional systems. And uh, these uh, study of these um, mesoscopic systems um, you know uh, at low temperatures it has been one of the uh, most uh, studied fields in condensed matter physics in recent times and um, uh, there are a lot of advancement happens in happened in the in the last uh, maybe two or three decades on the fabrication techniques. So, uh, we are able to uh, fabricate low dimensional systems at low temperature and so on and uh, not only that there are a farther uh, developments of adding electrodes and studying the conductance. So, the conductance uh, properties of these uh, mesoscopic systems are of uh, importance and they have uh, been uh, everywhere in the study of condensed matter systems. So, uh, and by conductance we mean uh, resistance as well. Uh, so, it is the transport properties of these mesoscopic systems and systems being uh, developed and fabricated um, at uh, lower dimensions and have uh, you know uh, uh, dimensions of the order of few nanometers or uh, 
maybe hundreds of nanometers. Uh, we they, those are available experimentally, and uh, one can also uh, attach electrodes in order to study the conductance properties. All right. So why is it important? We have to understand that. And the reason that it is important is that especially at low temperatures the quantum mechanical phenomena can be uh, well understood. So, what we mean by quantum mechanical phenomena are that those uh, uh, which relate to the uh, you know the observation of quantized energy scales of the problem and uh, the quantized energy scales are they come with a, um, a scale of H cross say for example or h cross omega the energy comes with a scale of h cross omega and um, so these conductance properties they explicitly uh, give rise to these if there are modes available for uh, the electron transport then only uh, the the conductance will show a peak else the conductance will show a plateau it's uh, something like that uh, so uh, that's a very important thing that uh, like uh, you know if you can actually in the lab uh, see direct manifestation of quantum phenomena uh, those are uh, very interesting. And um, it is also important to understand that uh, uh, you know these uh, at low temperature particularly the conductance of the resistance properties are very different from Ohm's law. Uh, Ohm's law talks about uh, you know the, uh, the voltage uh, being proportional to the current and uh, the, the proportionality constant is known as R, uh, the resistance of the, uh, of the sample. Uh, however, and we know that there are uh, parallel and series combinations of resistances that are available and um, uh, in uh, l these mesoscopic systems at low temperature they uh, do not obey those uh, addition of resistance formula either for series or for parallel. There is uh, one more important thing that is uh, these uh, conductance features are proportional to the number of electrons that are present or the number of carriers that are present uh, at the Fermi level. Uh, so, um, in fact that can be tuned that is uh, this is called as the density of states. The density of states can be tuned uh, using external gate voltages. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, which is uh, very important uh, last but not the least as they say is uh, that uh, the interaction effects, uh, disorder effects um, and the scattering between the carriers and impurities and, uh, uh, and disorder and imperfections that can also be studied in these uh, conductance properties of these um, uh, mesoscopic systems or uh, below the, uh, the scale of mesoscopic systems. Right now, you know the discussion that we are going to have is not directly related to uh, the quantum Hall effect. Okay? We will talk about that we are simply talking about see quantum Hall effect is also uh, measurement of resistance uh, when you pass a current in the longitudinal direction and measure the uh, voltage in the transverse direction. Here we are only talking about measuring the, the voltage uh, along the direction of the current. So, we are talking about either resistance or uh, the inverse of it as conductance. So, this is a general discussion that precedes the discussion on quantum Hall effect, a general one that will help uh, the, the audience to understand how uh, lower dimensional systems these conductance properties or the conduction properties are important uh, for us to understand. Okay? In this connection there are a number of length scales that are present and uh, one of the most important length scale is uh, it is called as the coherence length and uh, it is denoted by uh, let us call it as L phi you will probably see uh, various definitions of uh, these what is called as a coherence length and so on. Uh, so, it is basically just to tell you that it is the distance over which an electronic wave function maintains its coherence. That is the phase does not change uh, even if it changes it maintains a relationship uh, between uh, the initial phase and the final phase. So, there, there is a well defined phase so to say. So, it is a distance over which the electrons travels uh, where it retains the phase information. 
Okay. So, that is called as uh, uh, the coherence length and uh, a related quantity is called as uh, tau phi which is called as the coherence time. So, this coherence time is called tau phi and these L phi and tau phi are denoted by uh, root over d and a tau phi. Now, you see that uh, there is a clear deviation from uh, Newton's law of motion where uh, the L is uh, known to be uh, linear in time whereas, this uh, the L phi and tau phi which are length and time are, are not related in a linear manner and there is a square root involved and moreover this d is called as the uh, diffusion constant. Okay. So, and uh, this tau phi inverse is called as the diffusing or uh, rather it is called as a dephasing rate, not diffusing it is a dephasing rate. Okay. And uh, how is this uh, d coming into the picture? The d comes into the picture as uh, you know the d uh, the, uh, this uh, d is related to uh, the conductance sigma uh, via this relation that sigma equal to E square this is electronic charge uh, and d n d e and uh, d okay, where you know n is the electronic density and um, the d and d stands for the density of states. So, the what we get here is that the conductance of a system is uh, related to the, the diffusion constant and the density of states by this formula. Okay. So, the existence of a finite L phi that, so if the, if this coherence length is finite. So, that uh, distinguishes incoherent transport from a coherent transport. Okay. So, once again just to remind you uh, the word coherent means that uh, the electron actually preserves uh, the information about the phase uh, in moving from one uh, point to another and over the distance it preserves that information is known as a coherence um, length. Okay. So, this distinguishes uh, between incoherent and coherent transport. Okay. So, uh, this is another thing that is important here is that this L phi and uh, tau phi they depend upon the temperature. T okay. and uh, these uh, temperatures. So, basically with the increase in temperature L phi and tau phi uh, decreases which means that the coherence goes down. Uh, because of thermal effects and uh, it is easy to understand why that happens uh, because the, uh, the number of collisions increase and the system actually undergoes through inelastic collisions at large temperatures because of thermal effects. And what we mean by uh, uh, inelastic collision is that uh, the momentum is of course conserved in any collision, but the energy is not conserved. Okay. So, uh, now it is very important uh, that uh, these L phi and the system length. So, the system length let us talk about a linear dimension uh, to be L and this should have a relationship. You see if L is much greater than L phi that means that uh, you have a large system and this system is much larger than the coherence length. If that happens, then the electrons will undergo many collisions. Okay, uh, and when they emerge out from the other end, and uh, you have attached electrodes or leads, and when they emerge out, 
uh, there will be a large uh, number of inelastic collisions which it has suffered and uh, in which case, uh, so we understand that in that case the thermal effects will be dominant, um, the, the temperature will actually rule the transport and we must be in the classical regime. Whereas, if we are in the opposite limit that is your L phi is much greater than L, in that case you have the quantum mechanical features becoming important. So, here the classical effects are important and in this case the quantum effects rule. Okay. So, along with that uh, there is another length scale that is important uh, which is called as a mean free path. So, just to remind you that the mean free path was uh, discussed or rather introduced by Drude uh, in his model for uh, electronic transport uh, that gives rise to you know uh, metals. So, uh, if you start with a metal that is if you have a metal and uh, then this metal has uh, free electrons. Now, if the electrons are completely free then there cannot be any resistivity, but we know that the metals have resistivity and this is what uh, you know your I square R where I is the current uh, and R is the resistance that is equal to the power dissipated in the system and that gives rise to joule heating. Uh, so, uh, this V into I or I square R or V square by R all these are different forms of uh, the power dissipated uh, in the system. Uh, these uh, kind of uh, situations, so you need a scattering mechanism in order to bring in the notion of resistance and that is what uh, happened uh, when Drude proposed that actually these electrons are otherwise free but uh, they undergo collisions and between two such collisions uh, they uh, propagate like free particles. Okay? And not only that he made one more very important comment there and uh, if you look at it carefully it says that uh, the electrons are completely randomly uh, directed after any collision. So, the average velocity is 0, uh, but the speed that is if I ignore the direction the speed of the electron after a collision uh, is proportional to the local temperature of the system and that is how he uh, brought in the notion of temperature. So, a hotter region will emit uh, or eject uh, more energetic electrons. Okay? Now, that gave rise to these uh, collisions between the electrons that gave rise to uh, the resistivity uh, of this material and uh, the mean free path is the distance uh, that the electron travels between two successive collisions. And here also it means the same thing, let me write it with L m f p just to uh, make sure that this mean free path. So, this is the, uh, the distance that an electron travels between two successive collisions. Okay, so, uh, based on these length scales let me uh, define two regimes and uh, these two regimes are called as uh, uh, one is called as a diffusive regime. where let us also define another length scale uh, which interatomic distance. So, that is basically the distance between two atoms or ions and let us call that as A. So, uh, this is the distance. Now, what happens is, so in the diffusive regime your A is much smaller than L m f p is smaller than much smaller than L which is the dimension of the system or the system size so to say 
and which is less than L phi. So, there is a diffusive regime which is what we have said that the, uh, where the conductivity is determined by the uh, diffusion constant and uh, there is also a ballistic regime where uh, A is much smaller than M f p and uh, this is of the order of L and it is still uh, much smaller than L phi. So, these two are the uh, regimes that we uh, need to consider for considering uh, the conductance properties of the mesoscopic systems. Okay? So, in the ballistic regime, the conductance scale is set by is set by uh, these quantity called as a 2 e square by h and um, so we will see that as we progress that h over e square is equal to the unit of resistance just the opposite of that excepting the factor 2 and this factor of 2 actually denotes summation over spins. So, there are up and down spins. So, these two factor of 2 uh, uh, represents that and this is the unit of resistance and this is the biggest triumph of uh, quantum Hall effect that it could actually the plateaus the quantum Hall plateaus that we will see uh, are uh, completely uh, you know quantized in unit of this. Okay? So, it is like h over e square, h over 2 e square, h over 3 e square and so on and so forth. Okay. And so, this sets the unit of resistance which is approximately 225.8 kilo ohm whereas, uh, you know this um, E square over H uh, also has a, a value which is inverse of that. Okay. We can write down that uh, value also. So, uh, the conductance has a unit. So, this is a unit of conductance which is just the opposite or rather inverse not opposite inverse which is given by uh, 3.874 into 10 to the power minus 5 uh, ohm inverse or you can call it as mo. Uh, of course, there is another uh, length scale which is often used that is called as a localization length. And it could have been brought into the discussion, but it is uh, not essential because uh, you know these are the two primarily the two regimes where the conductance in um, mesoscopic systems are studied. Uh, but nevertheless, this uh, localization length is uh, the length over which certain observable or a physical quantity uh, that falls to a value which is um, 1 over E. Like for example, this uh, G uh, the conductance which uh, is equal to some G 0. So, this is in presence of disorder. So, this is like minus L by xi or maybe sometimes it is written 2 L by xi. So, this G 0 is the conductance without disorder. So, at a distance L equal to xi which is the localization length. Uh, g falls to a value which is g 0 over E. Okay? So, this is the definition of uh, localization length. Now, let us you know uh, derive a formula for the conductance which is uh, the next task that uh, we have. This is called as a, a Landauer conductance formula. Uh, Landauer is a name of a uh, scientist uh, who has uh, written it down and so on. So, uh, let us uh, talk about this uh, regime initially let us talk about L uh, greater than L phi which means that uh, this inelastic collision and this is like. So, there are collision with what? So, between the electrons and 
maybe with other electrons, maybe with phonons, maybe with impurities, disorder, defects, anything. Okay. So, this uh, inelastic collisions will be there and uh, a classical transport will prevail. Okay. And what is meant by classical transport? Either you talk in terms of Drude formula or you can also talk in terms of uh, the Ohm's law. Okay. They mean the same thing. So, uh, the temperature uh, of the system decides what will be your tau inverse is decided by the temperature. So, what it means is that the temperature is large which is a classical regime and then uh, tau inverse will be very small which means the electrons undergo several several collisions uh, within the, uh, the linear dimension L of the system. Okay? And uh, in this case the of course, the Drude, Drude's law or, or for example, Ohm's law to be valid. All right. Now, you know, one has to understand that uh, of course, we are not going to talk about this uh, limit. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, L to be less than L phi or even much lesser than L phi uh, such that the quantum effects are important is the other limit that is uh, important. All right. So, you have to understand that uh, when you make a measurement of uh, the conductivity or the resistivity, uh, you need to attach leads. Okay? And this is what is done in the labs in all undergraduate labs or the labs that you all have attended. It is done by either a multimeter where you uh, put those uh, two uh, the leg or the leads. Um, and then on, on both sides of the sample and then you take the measurement. Okay? The multimeter gives you a reading or there are more elegant way of doing this. There are two probe methods and there are four probe methods uh, which uh, so you, you actually uh, measure current by sending a current in and along two directions and measure the voltage along the other two directions that is a four probe and in a two probe method you uh, measure it uh, in whichever direction you send the current you measure the voltage in the same direction. All right. So, uh, we are uh, going to attach leads and uh, these leads are uh, very perfect metals near perfect metals. Okay? Uh, so, which we will call as ideal conductors. So, in order to derive that let me uh, draw a schematic diagram which will help you understand that. So, this is like a sample. So, this is a the whole setup not a sample the sample is here. So, we will call this sample as scattering regime. Okay? So, in the sample the all the scattering happens and as I said earlier that the scattering uh, does not only mean electron electron scattering it could be between electrons and impurities electrons and disorder electrons and um, phonons and, and various other things. Okay? And now, uh, this is the ideal conductor uh, or the electrode or the leads. Okay? So, this is an ideal conductor, this is one lead and this is the other lead. Think in terms of the multimeter probes that you attach uh, on two sides. Uh, so, these are those uh, leads that are there and um, there is a bath okay? and there is a bath there which uh, our bath means that uh, you know uh, they have a large number of electrons. Uh, uh, so, they are the bath of electrons. So, if, if the electrons actually uh, go from uh, towards the right or towards the left the electron density in the bath is unaffected and as well as the temperature of the bath is unaffected. And that is uh, like saying this bath means nothing but the battery or the bias voltage that you connect it to. Okay? And uh, just as an example, let us say that this is the, uh, the mu a is the uh, chemical potential of conductor 1 and uh, mu b is the uh, chemical potential of these ideal conductor which is the other lead or the electrode. So, lead and electrode they mean the same thing and there is a, a mu 1 say for example, 
which is uh, the chemical potential of bath on the left and there is a mu 2 which is the chemical potential of the bath in the right region. So, just to remind you that uh, mu is a chemical potential and uh, uh, the chemical potential is the energy that is required to add one electron in the uh, system. Okay? Now, you could say that in a system of fermions, uh, you could only uh, add an electron only at the Fermi energy at t equal to 0. Okay? If you are not at t equal to 0, it will be some other uh, energy which is slightly bigger than the Fermi energy uh, because the Fermi energy or the Fermi surface loses its meaning uh, at finite temperature. Uh, so, why is this chemical potential a finite quantity? Why cannot you just add one electron to the system? Uh, without spending any energy. Why is it not 0? And it is not 0 for the simple reason that uh, all the, uh, the other electrons, the n electrons that are already there in the system, uh, they have to readjust in order to come to equilibrium with this new particle or this new electron being added to the system. Okay? So, there is certain amount of energy cost and that is the uh, chemical potential. And if you want to understand it simply, then you take this uh, uh, nice distribution which is a Fermi distribution for electrons and uh, it is uh, a step function. So, all the states uh, below certain E f, uh, let us write it with, a, with an epsilon which you are probably more familiar with and this is the epsilon f. Okay? So, that is the Fermi energy. So, if you want to all these states are filled okay, with uh, you know one quantum state is being um, occupied by at the most two electrons one spin up and spin down. So, you, you need to if you need to add one electron more you will have to add it here. Okay? There is no other way because all the states are filled and uh, because of the Pauli exclusion principle they are not going to take any more electrons. All right. So, in this thing let me uh, you know show that there are these modes called n, uh, we will tell you what these modes are, uh, there is a mode called uh, m and uh, the reflection amplitude is let us call it as r m n and uh, similarly you have a t m n. Uh, so, what these modes are, these modes are the allowed energy levels of the system of the ideal conductor. So, when an electron goes from left to right and uh, it incidence on these boundaries, these boundaries are let us say labeled as A, B, C, D. So, we have uh, you know uh, sort of uh, four boundaries. Uh, so, uh, then an electron with energy n can get scattered into uh, another level called m which is either it is called mode or it is called channel. So, n and m are uh, modes slash channels. Okay? So, there are different uh, modes or different channels that are present uh, in the system which are the electrons uh, dispersions and um, so, it, it represents a system comprising of a scattering regime uh, which is sandwiched between two ideal conductors which are leads or the electrodes and in the ideal conductors the electrons are assumed to be free and the wave functions um, are written as a product of, uh, so this is important, this is your let me also uh, set the scale, the coordinate axis so to say. Okay. So, uh, we uh, write down the uh, wave function of this system to be a product of phi n y, now that is the y direction uh, which is what I showed here, uh, this is the y direction. So, in y direction the system is uh, not infinite. So, I have taken a strip of the system okay? and in the x direction you can think of it as infinite. So, uh, in the x direction of course, uh, uh, this is going to be a exponential i k uh, n x. So, the total wave function is going to be the product uh, of these uh, phi n y n exponential i k n of x. So, this is equal to psi n of uh, you know x y and uh, you, you can put a plus minus here, uh, plus would correspond to 
uh, sort of moving uh, towards the electron moving towards the right and minus may correspond to something moving towards or the electron moving towards the left. And this thing uh, comes because uh, you know exponential i pi equal to minus 1. So, if you add to uh, say exponential i x, if you add a exponential i x plus pi, uh, then it becomes equal to minus I mean exponential minus x. So, this gets the phase gets uh, reflected. So, there is a k x there which I forgot ok. So, this thing and uh, so this becomes you know it is reflected as a exponential minus i k x ok. So, this uh, is and there is a um, normalization which is given by k n where k n is equal to root over uh, 2 m e minus e n divided by uh, h cross square. Uh, so, this e n these uh, denote the modes or the channels. So, this is the wave function and uh, I have used uh, 1 by root over k n as the uh, normalization uh, constant. So, this is the wave function. So, an incoming wave psi n plus uh, from the left once again let us go to this from the left of the scattering region it, it incidents at this uh, B this um, uh, region that uh, distinguishes between an ideal conductor and the scattering region. Uh, so, it is uh, partially reflected into a psi m uh, minus ok. So, a psi n plus is incident from, from left and uh, it, it scatters as psi m minus is reflected. Uh, so, this is on the surface B uh, or the surface that divides the scattering uh, regime with the ideal conductor and so on. So, what is this E here? This E is nothing but equal to the variable energy of the problem that is E equal to coming from the bias voltage ok. So, very similar scenario emerges at this C as well and uh, there will be a reflection towards the left and there will be a transmission towards the right ok. So, these R m n and T m n are uh, reflection amplitude and T m n are transmission amplitude. Okay. So, then what happens is that your uh, total transmission is in the channel n or with energy E n is a sum over all the m's, all the other m's and T m n mod square. So, the, uh, the amplitude mod square gives you the this uh, transmission coefficient and the conductivity is proportional to the transmission coefficient ok. So, now if you consider n r channels, total of n r channels in the right and n l channels on the left ok on the, on the right and on the left. Then uh, you have a S matrix which can be written as R T prime T and R prime. So, I uh, sort of I am assuming that you know uh, what is S matrix. S matrix is uh, you know in this barrier transmission problem you write down uh, these uh, the coefficients here A and B this coefficient is C and D and let this coefficient be F and G. So, there are these 2 by 2 matrices that uh, connect A, B and C, D and C, D and F, G and these uh, matrices uh, have are governed by certain general properties uh, and these matrices have they are unitary matrices and um, they are related to the scattering matrix. I am skipping that discussion here 
uh, but we will probably come back uh, later. And uh, r and t are the reflection and the transmission uh, coefficients uh, for these ideal conductor you know uh, these two ideal conductors. So, actually it is uh, a Tmn is getting transmitted, but something is getting reflected also. So, there is a Tmn here as well uh, which is towards this ok and uh, we will call for the second uh, uh, ideal conductor we will call this as Tmn prime and uh, so that is the prime. So, these two are uh, the R and T they correspond to the, uh, the ideal conductor on the left and R prime and T prime uh, they correspond to the ideal conductor on the right ok. And um, this S matrix because of this uh, has a dimension which is N L plus N R uh, multiplied by N L plus N R ok. So, if you call this as N, uh, this S matrix is a N cross N where N denotes the total number of modes uh, that exist ok. And what is your uh, mu 1 and mu 2? So, mu 1 and mu 2 is nothing but E V ok. So, that is the biasing voltage. So, what you have done is that you have biased it here. Uh, so, you have biased it here. Okay. So, it is like this ok. You know so, this is a, a voltage V I did not want to uh, draw it earlier, uh, but the understanding is the same that these baths are connected to battery ok. So, this mu 1 minus mu 2 equal to E V and then uh, we have this uh, D I N. So, that is an elemental current in the nth channel from left to right is written as uh, rho n, v n and t n which is the transmission coefficient which is a function of this biasing voltage and uh, this is also the Fermi distribution function which is uh, E minus uh, mu 1 and uh, d e. So, that is the, uh, the current that flows from left to right from left to right that is the current. So, what is rho n? V n is basically the velocity and rho n is uh, the basically the density which is equal to 2 pi h cross V n. So, rho n and V n would cancel and uh, what eventually you will get is that d i n uh, L by R is equal to E over pi h cross uh, T n of E ok and f of E minus mu 1 uh, and d E. Similarly, you will get a d i n R to L is equal to E by pi h cross uh, the two will uh, cancel uh, and uh, now you have it as 1 minus sum over m because it is at the other uh, junction, uh, junction which we have called it as uh, C at the junction C. So, this is R m n prime uh, and square ok. So, this is uh, and, and then of course, uh, E minus uh, mu 2 uh, and d. So, this is the current that is flowing from right to left and the other current the one that is here is from left to right and this is right to left. So, the net current will actually be the difference of 1 minus 2. So, the net current it is 1 minus 2 ok. And in calculating that we can have uh, we can see that it is E minus mu 1 and E minus mu 2. Uh, these are the respective chemical potential and uh, this is like a minus del f del e. Uh, I leave it to you to figure out that this is indeed equal to this where I have done a, a Taylor series expansion of f uh, about the energy E. So, the total uh, current is equal to uh, mu 1 minus mu 2 divided by pi h cross and then d e and a minus del f del e and uh, sum over m n uh, and t m n 
uh, E uh, mod square. So, this is the current expression and that will give rise to the conductance. So, the conductance will be I over V. Uh, so, we uh, divided by uh, this V is equal to uh, mu 1 minus mu 2 divided by E. We have said that earlier. So, when we divide it by that your uh, um, your G becomes equal to a D E uh, minus a del F del E and a trace of T dagger E uh, T E. Okay. And uh, uh, so, uh, at very low temperature or at 0 temperature at very low uh, or at 0 temperature the uh, del F del E is nothing but uh, a delta function which you understand because uh, once again uh, this is like this. The, so, it is everywhere 0 but here it is infinity. Okay? So, because there is a uh, discontinuity there. So, that gives you that at low temperature or at 0 temperature. So, this is equal to 2 e square by h uh, trace of uh, T dagger E and T of E. Okay? So, this is called as the Landauer formula and this is what we wanted to find out. And uh, so, this is the conductivity given in terms of the transmission amplitudes which are T. So, this is T dagger and as I said that this T's are uh, matrices which are 2 n NL uh, plus N R cross N L plus N R. So, it is like N cross N matrices and so on and this 2 is coming for the spin degeneracy. Okay. And it is a very good uh, formula because it takes into account uh, the effect of the contact resistance between the electrodes and the, uh, the system which is the scattering regime. Okay? So, the electrons actually enter from left to right from the electrode to the scattering regime and they see a different environment and that environment actually scatters them. Okay? So, this gives you, uh, so basically the trace of uh, T dagger T it gives you the number of modes. And this number of modes will depend of course, on the Fermi energy and as the system is driven, the Fermi energy rises. So, it accommodates more and more electrons and um, uh, so this uh, th there are further you know conducting channels that open up. In, in general, you know this G is actually even in presence of a magnetic field, uh, this G is actually even. Okay? So, so, what we have seen is that uh, we have uh, taken a sort of experimental system where you have sort of a material whose resistance you are going to find out. So, you will put leads and you will put battery. The leads are the ideal conductors and the battery gives, it drives the system. It supplies electrons, it sort of uh, manipulates the Fermi energy and in this condition we have seen that uh, it is like a, a simple scattering problem uh, of electrons across a boundary and that gives rise to this nice uh, uh, formula which is called as the Landauer formula. Okay. As I said that this is uh, very general, okay. it is not uh, restricted to uh, Hall effect or um, you know quantum Hall effect, uh, but we will see that this is a general you know scheme of calculating uh, resistance or conductance uh, of uh, a mesoscopic system which um, we will be talking about throughout this course. Okay. Mm -hmm.